Hi there, adapters and adapters tech X. It's great to have everybody back and for a very interesting uh, podcast. Uh, thanks to the team at Questex and AHC annual hotel conference in Manchester, where we had an outstanding event, lots of great things to share. And uh, I had the pleasure of chairing the tech uh, roundtable and council uh, at the show. So more to follow on that. Today is very exciting. We're going to talk about sustainable architecture with Neil Davies. Neil is uh, by far one of the leading thinkers in the space of sustainable uh, architecture buildings across a variety of asset types. And we're going to talk more about that. You may have already caught the quick hit uh, that we had on earlier where, you know, we barely scratched the surface, but came away with some great tips and takes specifically about uh it's not about carbon, it's about measuring energy. It's not about just energy, it's putting in the right kit. And so we're gonna have a, a, a bit of chatter about that. But more importantly, probably what we didn't share at the quick hit uh, world uh, was uh, the fact that, that Neil is big into pirates. You know, he's, he's actually, you can't see him right now, but he's got an eye patch on um, and he's, and you know, he's just all dressed up and, and ready to go. Neil, how are you doing? It's good to see you again. We, we just You're got right. warmed keep, up on the other show. Keeping, keeping this parrot. You got a carrot or a parrot? Keeping this parrot quiet is, uh, no, no, no. You, well, yeah, I mean, a parrot eating a carrot. You're a man into pirate. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a big, there's a, it's a big thing down here. Like Hastings actually has um, a huge, uh, huge amount of people who dress up as pirates, um, both in, uh, in normal day to day and also on their uh, on their annual pirate day which usually is populated by about 20,000 pirates down on the front which is quite quite something we should hey art we should do a show there we need to do a show at the the annual hastings uh pirate. is that on international talk like a pirate day or is that a different date no i i don't know they just cut it's just pirate day i don't know whether it's a global pirate day or not but the um but yeah definitely we in pirate con like we usually have a kind of a a be more pirate day which uh, i know is a favorite um a favorite book of a friend of mine, um, Steve Lowy. So uh, yeah, there's uh, we could have a, a gathering of fellow. That, that fellow sounds pirates. amazing. So you know, being the pirate that you are, and uh, the other voice you're hearing is uh, our Art Lurie, who is uh, you know our great executive producer and director of thinking. And uh, for again, for those people that can't hear it, he's got a big um, guy called Bill. Uh, what is Bill in the background there? Describe that for the listeners. Bill has become something of a celebrity. My my daughter found him on eBay. He is a giant Playmobil character. I'd say he's a sort of road worker or something. And he's been in the background of uh, calls, Zoom calls, Skype calls, you know, every kind of call last uh, week or two. And yeah, he, he already has a lot of fans. I think it's going to be... Uh, it's kind of difficult to hand him back to my daughter now and the grandchildren, but I, I think he looked kind of nefarious and I'm convinced that he's got a camera in his forehead or one of those eyeballs that keeps looking at me. So other than that, it's, it's perfectly normal. So for context for our listeners, Hastings is where, because we have listeners all over the world. Right. Hastings, uh, Hastings is the South coast of the UK, um, in, uh, in Sussex. Um, and uh, over the other side of the uh, over so the other side of the channel is uh, is France. Um, so yeah, we're about um, well on the train, probably around about kind of hour forty five or so, um, so south of uh, south of London. Um, but lovely, lovely part of the world. You know, the uh, the area just north of us, uh, High Weald, is uh, an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, the uh, the beaches um, are normally very nice, but uh, Southern Water. Have other plans for that um, currently, or rather their owners, Macquarie, who keep discharging sewage onto them. Um, but that is a topic for another day. Um, but other than that, yeah, it it's, is. Uh, you know, I think we'll save the, we'll save the sewage bit for later. Maybe we'll get into that. Maybe it's sustainable. Who the who the heck knows? Clearly, you grow better wheat down near Hastings because <laughs> the natural <laughs> effluent that that uh, you share. Yeah. So you know, one of the things we didn't get to in in our quick hit was, uh, you know, the book or, or whatever has inspired you uh, to be, uh, you know, a leading thought, thought leader in um, the world of architecture, sustainability and all things that may be circular. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's not actually a book. Um, you know, I must, uh, I must declare that. Um, it's, I would say, really kind of what started 
me off on this kind of process is actually an album. Um, it's uh, it's Man Machine by Kraftwerk, um, and that really that album. Yeah, you know, when I first listened to it, like I wasn't around when it first came out in in seventy eight, um, but really the kind of freshness and also what it led me to discover. You know, on, on the journey, you know, I discovered you know, Africa Van Barter and then a load of techno DJs, Detroit DJs, and also that that whole that whole sort of culture of innovation and kind of, a, you know, a real techno, uh, techno sensibility um, informs a lot of what I do today. Connect the dots there. Uh, so you come from, you know, this inspirational uh, cross Atlantic international music influence. And how does that connect into the architecture? In a way, it's it's all about invention, um, you know. So that you know, those guys with the synthesizers, um, you know, that were completely man-made, um, were making, you know, what they felt was you know a completely new sound, but that was informed by you know the, the classical uh, musicians gone by. Um, and to my mind, you know, that that whole sort of culture of um, of reinvention or invention in a way is, you know, we understand you know the, the traditional way of doing things. Um, but really, actually, with kind of the current technology, some of it, you know, a little bit Heath Robinson, but, you know, some of it is kind of emerging is actually to kind of create a whole new way, a whole new way of thinking about buildings and how they perform and how they're how they're much more ecologically uh, responsible um, and how you kind of measure them and how they, uh, you know, how they uh, respond to the kind of needs of today going forward. So that's really it might that's what I take from you know how why I discovered or how I discovered kind of craft work and you know where it goes on you can read into uh really anything as you want but that that really is the kind of core to what we do um and yeah it, it really it all starts with with craft work do you know Beato Rick Beato uh, no you're okay you, you're gonna, so no. <laughs> So here's the connection. So Rick Beato does, if you look on YouTube, look up Rick, for those listening, if you're big into synth, uh, Rick Beato does amazing stuff. Uh, he'll, he has a whole piece on synthesizers and the technology of that. And he's done some amazing layering of, you know, the stuff that went into um, what uh, Eurythmics were doing and how they lay it down and all that complexity and believe me it was it's really good i think you'll love that i think you'll love that so rick beato b-e-a-t-o um love all that that era so you know some of the buildings that you've really focused on uh and you've said look uh these are these are neil davies signature buildings give us some examples of what they are and what you've done with them are they houses are they offices you know you've done museums you've done all sorts of stuff what stands out as something that says, I'm really proud of that, and, and what is it, where is it, and why? Well, a lot, a lot of all of our projects don't actually look hugely different to if they didn't have all of that tech built in. So the, 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 the clever part, or rather kind of the hard part to all of this stuff is how do you make the tech disappear? So how, look, Tech is all around us. It's ubiquitous. We can't get away from it, but it's it's really a kind of question of how you live with it. Um, so whether it's one-off houses, whether it's kind of palaces in New Delhi, whether it's you know a, a you know a gallery in uh, a gallery in Grand Rapids, or or anything in between, it none of this stuff has to look any different, has to feel any different. It can still reach out to you know the the, the tactility of of you know all great pieces of architecture. But the thing is, is that you actually kind of understand the tech to kind of hide it in there, um, make sure it works so that it's not, it, you know, it just is there and you might have a hockey puck of a, of a nest there and stuff on the wall and things like that. But everything else, it's just kind of quietly performing a bit like a duck, you know, with the legs flapping furiously under the water and it's serenely gliding over the top. So all of this stuff is, I think what, what I'm most proud about as we've kind of developed and as we've kind of finessed our architecture you know over the years and we'd be very you know very grateful and very lucky with the clients that we've worked with who've who've you know you have gone with us and and had the confidence to um you know to trust what we've been been saying is that um really all of this uh all of this was made possible by them you know going with our vision and kind of trusting us at, certainly at times where 
you know, for instance, you know, one of my clients has a uh, has a property up in uh, in the Catskills, um, and you know, at the time, you know, nearly ten years ago now, you know, he was putting in a pond. I mean, in the UK version of a pond, that's a lake, um, but in the US, it's quaintly called a pond. Um, and we've just put a coil in the bottom um, and said, look, you know, look, honestly, trust me, put this coil in the bottom and we'll we'll strap it to a, a heat exchanger and all the all the clever gizmos that we had at the time. And everyone was like, you're mad. What are you doing? This is this is never going to work. Um, it's powered his farmstead ever since. And that that was really quite forward thinking at the time. But now it's mainstream thinking. And a lot of that, a lot of those opportunities are are really led by the clients going with us and saying, yeah, okay, well, you know, let's let's do that and let's and they pay for it and go for it. And that leads to the kind of evolution of of the ideas and finessing of the ideas that are, you know, day to day. And I, you know, I, I'm as proud of, you know, just a coil at the bottom of the lake as I am to, you know, a lovely art gallery, you know, in in Michigan. It, you know, all of these things are they're they're important, but they're um they're all they're all pursuing an idea or they're all pursuing an ideology um, that really leads me down the path to try and make my buildings work harder, better, and also just, you know, add to the conversation. Um, it doesn't have to be overt. It doesn't have to be, you know, loads of prizes and gongs and all the rest of it. It's more about the pursuance of that idea um, to, to get to that next level, you know, to really kind of push, push the envelope no pun intended, push the envelope as as much as, as you can within the, you know, all of the contracts that, you know, that we have. So when you, when we move to now kind of a shift to, uh, and just getting to sustainability, which I know you're very passionate about, is that we're, we're sitting in a room and uh, we're, we're sitting there with a, an investor, heavy duty fund uh, specialist and, either buy to rent or multifamily, as it's called in the United States, or office buildings or, you know, co-living. And we're sitting there with an operator who may take a lease on that building or so they, they, they want to get the cheapest price they can. How would we have a meaningful conversation first with the investor to say, here's all the reasons. Here's three reasons, three primary reasons why you should put sustainability first on the investment agenda to convince the investment committee that this deal needs to be done with this level of commitment to sustainability. What would you say to that person to convince them? Quite simply, the first question is, how are you funded? Um, and and really, that is, the, that is the start of every conversation um, because it doesn't matter about the project itself it doesn't matter about the kind of building itself but ultimately you know the money is the thing that is paying for it and you know what are those investors or what does that bank or what does that fund want from this you know if, if you don't ask that fundamental question uh you are really not not getting to the nub of it at the first instance so you know once you have that first question and if there's a meaningful engagement from that saying actually they're interested in green tech or they're funded in a certain way that you know is looking at that or they're looking at creating ESG rated assets as complicated as that process is currently but all, all of this stuff has to start with that that kind of question really um, and then from then 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 it really either locks you know locks locks up and really you can't do anything or there's a proper engagement and then suddenly Really, everyone kind of opens up. So you, you've got your second tip. What's your second tip now that you've established what the uh, investment criteria is? So just for the sake of this example for our listeners, you know, it's a it's a pension fund that has a mandate that they must only invest in uh, ESG rated buildings uh, and have an SDG component to it, right? So sure. Uh, so now you've you've crossed that threshold. You know that they're going to invest. Now, what do you say to them? Well, the the next part of it is that they've whatever building that they that they buy or invest in, um, you've got to establish the the baseline of um, you know, look how how efficient or inefficient is this building? You know, in terms of you know energy usage, thermal performance, all all of this stuff. You'd need to really kind of go 
through it and do a proper you know, a proper analysis of that building. You know how how occupied is it, for instance? So you know certain buildings perform slightly better when they're fully occupied versus not occupied, which is you know an important part of of real estate currently today. You know a lot of office buildings aren't as occupied as they were. Um, you know and some some don't have the heating on. They can't afford to put the heating on. Um, so you know the rest of the building is cold. You know, and all 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 of that uh, comes into play. So, what you have to do is you have to kind of um, understand you know the stock that uh, that may um, may be purchased in in a much more granular fashion than look at the EPC. You know, what is it a C or a D? You know, how much can it be upgraded? And actually, really look at it, um, and then off that, then you can use that as a springboard right. too. Actually, we can improve that. So they have to go back there and now the operators on the other side going, oh my God, how much is this built? You know, the lease was this, now they're introducing this very green tech. And I want to come back to that, Neil, about what is green tech. And then, yeah. you know, so now the operators looking and go, well, what's in it for me? Yeah, I mean, we were, we were talking, I was just talking to, um, you know, a, a kind of a battery manufacturer about that earlier um, when they're talking about providing um sort of batteries to harvest surplus energy to local authorities or housing associations. And, you know, it's it depends, you know, how do you give um, the end users um, benefit when really kind of the, the building is owned by the housing association, has to invest in all of this, uh, in this tech, you know, well, and it's a similar way with, with, with tenants um, or rather someone that is taking on a lease is, okay, well, all of this it needs investment. Um, you, know, you have to kind of build in this tech. There's no getting away from that. But then, okay, how do you incentivize um, people? How do you incentivize um, tenants um, to to come in? Well, there there's a kind of a bigger issue there, which actually sometimes is beyond our control. You know, I mean, take for instance, um, you know, take someone like Fidelity. Now, Fidelity. Um, they are saying to their staff, um, you know, in in kind of all matters ESG, that actually we'd like to you to fly less, and when you are going to stay somewhere, we would like to you to stay in a a, a low energy or a sustainable whatever sustainability means, but a sustainable um, you know development or a hotel. And so there's a there's almost like a a, a, a sort of a, a, a dictate handed down to them that they actually have to do this. So ultimately, every anyone that's in the business of creating low energy buildings or sustainable buildings is thinking great okay well you have fidelity you know all their staff coming and staying that that's great so as we're as we're kind of getting um up to speed on esg or a lot of people are learning about this and thinking you know realizing its importance and also you know doing something about it um in in lots of different ways that creates a market for um you know for the uh, for the kind of the operator think okay well that that is worth my while you know i will take a lease right. in in a low energy building and and that and so it almost like it it's definitely um customer customer driven like you know sort of demand driven in a way um but then you've obviously got to create the you know the the, the product as well for to satisfy that customer demand you know, it's a, it's it's a great perspective when you think of. I love that N E. You know, what's in it for the end user, and whether where's that benefit, and whether it's a customer, whether it's the operator, what's 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 the end benefit to the investor, and and that's a whole different show on. You know, how how do we you know embed that from the income statement to the balance sheet, in a mm -hmm. way that that can transfer into all the reasons other than the fear of. Uh, Miami disappearing under, you know, a foot of water or a meter or two of water, depending on who's uh, measuring it, what part of the world. We're yeah, I mean, it. I mean, I can I can certainly, you know, answer a, a sort of a further answer to, to the one I just gave earlier is, is that, you know, certainly all my private clients, um, you know, they all want to invest in or they all want to have a house that has the best of you know, the, the latest renewable tech, and they want their buildings to be as efficient as they can be to to play their part. And I don't, the, I'm not, I'm not naive to, to know that, you know, the reason that people come to us is that that's what we do. And we advertise that fact. And so people are coming to us because they know that's what they're going to get. But ultimately, you know, without fail, every single client when asked, well, why, why would you do this? You know, this is going to cost more than 
the normal kind of traditional build. And, and actually, without prompting, most say, because I want to do the right thing. And I think there is there is definitely right. that sense in, mm-hmm. in generally in the public sense now where you know doing the right thing you know for the environment, no one really knows what the right thing is, but everyone wants to play their part. Um there will be some, obviously, that you know deny that the climate is changing and fine, you know, it, it's free speech is free speech. But ultimately there are there are there is a growing bunch of people out there that believe that doing the right thing means you know using the money that they have to actually um you know make their houses you know more efficient drive electric cars and all the rest of it um and that that is you know ignore that at your peril really and you know in in a lot of a lot of groups um because that that's the kind of silent majority and that is uh, that's definitely a growing a growing percentage yeah, I, I, it's it's great to hear it in more conversation. And, and you know, we could get into is this, uh, you know, some are really passionate about it and you're finding very practical ways uh, to to implement that and impact a local town, a local environment. And maybe hopefully that becomes viral in its behavior and prices come down so it's more affordable across more. So when we talk about green tech, how would you define that? What would be some of those examples of green tech? I mean, there's there's. A lot of different, um, a lot of different technologies, and really, it's the combination of the te- technologies that we we use. But, I mean, I'm the, one of the fundamentals that say uh, that's really a key to a lot of certainly a lot of the houses and a lot of the apartments and everything that we design um, is a Danish company called Nilan, um, and they have um, what is called and this is a bit of a mouthful, so bear with this. is um, It's a kind of two phase mechanical vent heat recovery unit. It's okay, Neil. I, I'm, I'm going to go take a break right now because my yeah, brain is that's overwhelmed. Fine. That's and fine. It's got like that, that really, really long Welsh uh, Welsh name. At the, uh, you know, <laughs> that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Um, but ultimately... Abergavenny uh, Tech. <laughs> that's right, yeah. So... But but ultimately, you know, the, so the, the clever the clever part about Nilan is that um, really when I say the two phase, it will both work. If it's cold outside, it'll work. But then it reverses. So if it's hot outside, it reverses, and that mm. takes in outside air, um, goes through a heat exchanger, and then you know plugs into you know a bit of a bit of kit that either creates hot or cold air, and the internal environment is is very steady. And, you know, w- within kind of. And can you can you change can you is there a th- is there a thermostat yes. on that yeah i mean it, it, you can down. you can change the heat you know you've got a thermostat right, yeah. but you can never you can never get it like super cold or super hot you know it's it's always you know just a comfortable range of you know sort of plus or minus two three mil or so right um but really yeah that's that's one of the things but that is also combined with uh you know an airtight construction of a certain level, um, you know, it has to be, you know, have to have a certain thermal performance, um, and you know, that's that's one of the the uh, one of the bits of tech that you know we've discovered a few years ago, and uh, and that's great. And then you can kind of combine that with renewables like you know PV panels or you know geothermal, you know, thermal fingers that go into the ground um, that do kind of heat exchange, um, you know, from the kind of the ground ground source heating. So that can all be combined. We've got projects at the moment where we we use the kind of pool, um, you know, essentially an outdoor swimming pool as, as a heat sink. Um, so, um, and then essentially that is a, a body of water which has a kind of fairly standard temperature, uh, depending on if it's really hot or really cold. You can use that temperature differential, um, you know, at using the kind of body of water because you have coils in the wall of the uh, of the swimming pool and then you strap that to to the right kit. Um, so, you know, I've got to tell you, I have so many friends with pools that they fall into the category largely of like a boat. I was happy when I bought it and I was happy when I sold it. So this this may be a real reason to say the pool is useful. Yes, it, you know, it genuinely is. It's not something you have to just chuck. Now, do you have one of those? I mean, in. you know, down in Hastings, do you have one of these flashy pools? I'd imagine you do. You do, yeah. It's, it's like this massive thing called the channel. Really? Yeah. It's got boats on it and everything. Concept. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're really, really good swimmer, you can actually swim, and then they you arrive at another place, and they they talk a funny language. I don't know where that is. That's great, isn't it? And keep in mind, we do have some friends in in France, so you know, would you please, yes. uh, you know, keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, but that that's impressive that that you've uh, now put the fingerlings into the the water and extracting the 
the, the, the heat out of the channel. Um, but we, we won't go there because there may be a discussion about fishing rights and all sorts of issues. So, but should... I mean, the, the, all, of, all of this tech, I mean, the fundamental on all of this is that this technology exists today. Yes. You know, all of the stuff that we have on NDA Labs, all of the stuff that we found, all of the stuff we're discovering, all the conversations that we're having with, with you know, remarkable people. And I'm not just saying that for, you know, p putting out the word of NDA Labs, but like unbelievably clever people that just like... Well, do you want to drop some names? Well, I mean, look, I mean, the one key one, you know, the conversation this morning, like, you know, Jazz from, from Econic, um, you know, in terms of the battery technology that they are, they're developing and they're, they're launching. I mean, you will hear about Econic um, in, uh, in months to come. I mean, it's an unbelievable company. Um, and, you know, they, we use their batteries in our houses to harvest um, all of the excess energy that those houses create. So, you know, and, and when you're really looking at, um, all of this in terms of, you know, we, we can only do so much, you know, we are, we are as good as the partners that we work alongside. Um, yeah, that's the 17th uh, sustainable development goal from the UN. And, you know, yeah. th this, this whole open way of doing business now, which I felt really kind of changed post pandemic, but it was kind of happening just before then really is is really you know you you can work with incredible people if you if you structure it in the right way and that just you know breathes life into you know our business their business and lots of different businesses um because you know we're all pulling together and we're all kind of you know, pulling in the direct, right direction um, and for listeners you know, uh, the 17 goals it's you can look at this up if you put down the 17 goals uh, yeah it, so i mean the, done, the un the un, UN. UN Sorry. Yeah, so UN sustainable uh, sustainable development goals. So that you yep. know, there's there's some really really great um, goals in there. You, um, everyone has different ones that their businesses you know relate to. Um, yeah, that that for me, I you know sort of learned about those and, and found out about those during during COP when it was up in Glasgow last year. Um, and that's really been one of the one of the kind of bedrocks of, you know, what we are doing and, you know, OK, you know, is this is on the right lines. Oh, well, look, and that's that's another UN Sustainable Development Goal. And and so it's not like a tick box in any way, but it's just it's it. All of this stuff is informs, you know, the the journey that, that you're on um, and um, and that. And, and that you sometimes need those guiding lights because you know when you when you're innovating and you know when you're when you're going against the grain it's um it's a it's a lonely old uh, lonely old path sometimes and you do need those kind of you need the wise men advising you um you need you know really willing um partners that are just brilliant um and uh, are very encouraging and you also just you know you, you got to have a few kind of things that you use as as beacons to kind of you know guide you through the through the fog yeah, you know, just for our listeners, and we'll we'll post this as well on the on the opener on it. It's a UNDP, right? So that's where the reports are, and you can see uh, under um, the UN and put in seventeen SDG, and it will come up. And it's a great framework of thinking if you want to participate in doing your bit. And collaboration is a big part of this. So you know, when we uh, as we begin to wrap up here, Neil, and we start thinking about, you know, what the leave behinds are here. You know, there's there's company, you know, there's B Corp, right, uh, out there that, uh, and I, I think one of my my uh, probably continued nudges is how we measure this. Uh, you know, I, I think we've watched you on panels. I've been on panels and you kind of, ESG is bandied around there and some people know what it means. And it's a huge topic. I mean, environmental, social governance and then all the streams that come off that and there's some great work now that's being done uh that uh you know cambridge and others are doing that and particularly coming off what the un have done is to make it approachable right it becomes tangible when people like me from with a finance background and go like oh, that's all well and good but i want to measure this stuff right now i want to i want to is it tangible and how do we transfer it from love to sustainable income and you know i'm thinking more commercial here it's a big topic so let me frame my question um company you know organizations like b corp for those that are, are listening it's a collaborative institution across many areas uh and geographies that have an assessment tool you can take and you can actually try and measure what you do so b corp 
and others. I, I'm, I'm not too sure I know if there's anybody else with that complexity in there. You know, this measurement piece that we've all been on panels and I've heard you go off the rails, you know, which is really fun when you go off the rails on the panel, uh, is uh, is saying, you know, that's great, but we got to measure this stuff. So how do we all work together to go, we put in one euro, one dollar, one yen, one pound in here, and we got this out as a result of the investment side in the future. You know, is there well, anything that you see? I would say, I would say that I mean, the first thing about B Corp, I mean, B Corp is 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 amazing. Um, you know, and uh, you know, we, we're we're about to embark on the kind of B Corp um, process at, at the moment. But B Corp is more about your your system, the way you manage it, um, and also looking at your supply chain, um, how you how you control that, how you make that. Um, socially responsible um i mean look, i I'm, i don't i don't want to sell big or short whatsoever and you know i've I've no intention of that to have been taken out of context but but ultimately you know that b is 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 fantastic and you know it is going to be with us to stay um but that's different from a lot of the different metrics for um for esg i mean you, you know you 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 mentioned um, in your in your notes before for our chat, you know about SE, SEE. Um, look, the ESG currently right now is incredibly complex. Um, you know, there's there are critics of ESG, um, and I I think some of that criticism is fair. Um, you know, I don't I don't think it's evolving, um, and it needs to improve. It it definitely needs to demystify, um, and. It may well be that ESG in its current form in a few years' time might actually be kind of split out. So it is easier um, to measure the E, the S, and the G. Um, partly because, you know, lumped all in one together, there are things that conflict and it's very difficult to, to measure. Arguably, E, the E part of it is easier to kind of measure than the S and the G. Um, but you know, there are there are very highly thought of kind of voices and kind of critics of ESG that are actually proposing changes to that actually that will be um, to the good regulatory um, guys need to kind of come to the table as well. Um, and I think really all of that conversation, the evolution of it, it, it shouldn't be dismissed. Um, and actually by giving it um, an acronym, there were a lot of people that hadn't even heard of ESG a few years ago. And now they're actually thinking, well, what can we do? Um, even before they go down and say an ESG route of just thinking, okay, well, you know, how do we run our business or what would, what do we need to do? So, but I think, I think that that one of the key things on all of this is that yes, our businesses need to evolve and they definitely need to kind of factor in, um, you know, how we are behaving in lots of different ways and be a lot more responsible um, because and this isn't me on my soapbox, it's, this matters because, you know, when your business matters to you, and if it's your business, the people that want to work for you, with you, alongside you, need to understand that you really get it. And, and actually, all of this stuff does matter. Um, you cannot attract talent today um, being a phony. And, and tricking it up and greenwashing the issues. It just doesn't wash with the younger generations. It should never have washed, but it definitely doesn't wash with the younger generations. Are way savvier, way more environmentally um, aware, and actually very more, much more socially aware um, about you know how businesses um, conduct themselves. And so all of this stuff in a wider piece, I know we're talking about tech, I know we're talking about, you know, ESG and stuff, but how you measure buildings, or sorry, rather how you measure businesses going forwards will change and is changing. Um, and, you know, B Corp is, is part of the acknowledgement of that, but it is moving towards, um, you know, stakeholder capital rather than shareholder capital. You touched on that, you know, earlier. And, and you know, those guys that think that it doesn't, you know, could be, you know, next year's Christmas turkey. Um, you know, it, it it may take longer, you know, to, to roast that turkey. Um, you know, you just you just don't know. But but we know from from uh, from direct experience, you know, trying to hire talent in a very difficult, um the very difficult market, um, you know, you you're you're anyway um fluffing your lines or or not knowing what you're talking about. 
A, you won't get a job, um, and B, you definitely won't get staff to to do the job. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. And one of one of the big shifts as we we see this in the workforce, particularly with the pressure economically, is why should I work there? Um, largely because maybe some of the opportunities that maybe our generations had are different now. So having a purpose and why, why is it that? And there's some great case studies. Unilever is an example uh, when they went through a massive change, if you remember, uh, maybe one or two CEOs ago, uh, you know, uh, made soap relevant. Why, why is soap relevant? Because we help people prevent disease by getting soap in their hands and washing their hands. And it's, it's, Taking that and making the work meaningful is, is hugely important. So as we wrap up, I, I remember now a long time ago in the quick hit uh, in, in our, uh, that uh, you had some tips and takes. Have they evolved into our conversation? Do you have two or three tips and takes now that, that we're going to wrap up the show with with uh, after talking about pirates um, utilizing the the world of uh, the channel as, as really some big, you know, exchange vessel and... Um, Obviously, giving free energy to the French. Well, I mean, they they own most of our energy, so um, yeah, you don't want to give them any more. But the um, but ultimately, I would say, without getting too political about it, um, look, I mean, all of this, all of this kind of whole process, you know, all, all of the you know the, the awakening that we're you know we're all we're all going through at the moment about you know energy and all the the you know energy crisis that you know that is is creating currently is um we we've got to understand you know what the, that baseline is period like you, you, you without that you don't know what you can kind of do going forwards um and once you once you have that baseline you know going from there is like okay well what you know what can you do about it like you know what what measures can you take really um and then you know beyond that in terms of like you know well let's you know, let's keep measuring it or let's just keep checking that this is this is good it's performing in the way the way that you want really um you know in uh, if you're just talking about um about about buildings about kind of projects and everything and uh, you know the, i would say there's a kind of a fourth bit is that you you got to have fun doing it like you know it all of this stuff doesn't need to be you know hand wringingly worthy you know that this this is you know this is a, is is fun too you know learning about new technologies you know uk is incredibly uh, capable of delivering some of this technology it's got some unbelievable uh, unbelievable brains um you know coming out of our education system that we should be rightly proud of and i think you know when you partner up with some of these some of these people um the, the sky is the limit um you know you you really we really can be a force for good and we can show the world how the art of the possible you know, it's that there's there's no limit, and there shouldn't be, and you know, especially now, um, you know, we really got to get on with it. Neil, it's been a real pleasure having you on, and we thank you sincerely for your openness. And uh, pleasure. we we know where we're going, Art. We're Art. We're going to be on the road. We're going to the pirate event. What <laughs> date is that again? Do you have the date? Do you have the date? I, I, I need to I need to find out. I think it's uh I mean I think we we've, we've just had one but there's two in a year. So uh I think there's like usually one around about kind of uh, end of October. But certainly all the bonfire societies everyone dresses up as pirates. Oh my god, I'm going to be burned at the stake probably for saying that. But there's the bonfire societies and then maybe there's pirate societies, I'm not sure. There's well, definitely a I'm, kind of a crossover. So, so um, that, no. we should definitely we should definitely do a podcast from from Pirate Con in Hastings next time. Yeah, that, that sounds yeah. That sounds great. So thanks to everybody uh, listening. Just a couple of uh, uh, notes there. There's lots to learn about this. And please reach out and start with a good Google search about what the UN 17 are. And that's a great place to start about a framework for thinking about what is, how can you impact um, and frame around the, the, the notion that is ESG and the framework that is SDG. And you got to go look those up because we're not going to make it easy for you. Uh, the second thing is, you know, there's a couple of great podcasts out there uh, that that speak to this uh, with uh, one that's uh, hosted by Laura Marie Edinger Shores. She's a professor at a university in Berlin. It's called the Sustainable Business Podcast. Some great, great uh, content there about that specific topic and a wide range of amazing guests that come on there. And then finally, we wrap up and, you know, there's some big uh, tips and takes here, but you know, this notion of being uh, an architect has changed. 
It's turned into an environmental enthusiast. It's changed into how to think about problem solving at a completely different level. It's become very much beyond design. It's, it's really engineering meets design. And for us to be able to learn and listen from what Neil brought to us has been a real pleasure. And there's some real takeaways. It can be fun. It doesn't have to be um, erudite. It can be something other than that. And we can really impact what we all do today, which is influence how people stay, how they think. And uh, the art of the possible is probably the way to end our podcast. So again, it was a great uh, show uh, at uh, AHC. Thanks to our friends at Quest Tech's uh, annual hotel conference. And don't forget, IHIF will be right there around the corner uh, as, as well. So uh, with that, a big thanks uh, to Art Lurie and the team at Hunter Gatherer for being the director and, and producer and great thinker that he is. And we'll be back. So keep on looking over the fence. Until next time, thanks.